door opens, Beyonce comes in with her video camera in her hand, with me standing in front of it. So like, I'm like, <laughs> on their own video. And I got to the pit and security stopped me. I said, no, no, it's all right. Yeah, they booked me to shoot as the only photographer for that, for that Royal Albert Hall show, Jay and Beyonce, and, and, and unannounced surprise guest was Nas. And he looks at me, he's like, Russell Simmons called you? I said, yeah. He said, why? I said, he wants to buy hiphop.com. Before we begin, please subscribe to the channel and click on the bell to receive the notifications. In the world of entertainment, we always hear about the people in the forefront. But what about the ones working behind the scenes who never get mentioned? My guest today is dangerous with a camera. His journey began in the early 90s and he's contributed as much, if not more, to the UK music culture as any artist has. The 521 sofa today is reserved for my good friend, who also happens to be an amazing and well-respected photographer, legend behind the camera, Paul H. Thank you, Blaine. Very kind. Mate, it's really good to have you here. I know we've been planning this for a hell of a long time. It's great to see the place as well. It's incredible. Uh, where do you want to start? Because obviously, like, you're one of those guys that has been doing a lot behind the scenes. Uh, anyone who's worked with you knows who you are, but the general public don't. I always had a love for music and hip hop. And um, that was before photography. So from, from when I was a child, just watching Top of the Pops at home um, and uh, dancing around the living room with my little brother. Um, and then hip hop came along and um, there were a few major influences when it came to hip hop there because it, it wasn't everywhere. You had to seek it out. But like I'd say certainly um, the movie Beat Street was a major, major influence. I went to see that when it came out. Then we used to rent it out on video until we knew every lyric and every word of the script to that movie i know oh, you could probably test me now if you got, okay you got, go on then. <laughs> right so <laughs> beat street how does it start what's the first ever like lyric or word in the in the movie itself so you should have known yeah, that yeah, like no, that. Kenny, kenny is sitting there um doing some graph on a oh no lee is doing some graph on a pad mm. and um and Kenny's sorting out his records and they're getting ready to go to a party. And um, Lee says to Kenny, Yo, Raymo, when are you going to teach me that style, man? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I wouldn't have remembered it, but now you see it, <laughs> yeah. it's coming back. And Kenny's like, Do practice you know? up on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that was a, a major influence. And then you had various influences here as well in London. And obviously... There was the book Subway Art that got us all into graph. And then you had Melly Mel on top of the pops, I think, with Chaka Khan. And then there was the step off and the white lines and the um, message. Oh, and when they used the message music in the Green Cross Code advert and, yeah, and, yeah. and Weetabix used the, um, uh, the Artful Dodger did the yeah. Weetabix billboard. And we were so excited to see graph like, on, a, on a billboard like that. Um, that, was, all, that was big for the London scene. It well, was. For the UK scene. And it was so visible. Was... And the, the Green Cross Code one was an interesting one too because if you think about... The, I, I found it on, on YouTube not too long ago and it was, a, it was a government public service announcement for kids to be safe on the roads. Mm. Don't step out when you're close to the edge. <laughs> and so really the government sponsored the growth of hip-hop in yeah. the UK <laughs> with, with, with that. Yeah. Um, and and I, I, I probably heard that before I heard the message. Mm. Um, and then when I heard the message, it was like a whole whole record of it. it was, and, and, and lyrically, it was an amazing record. So that was like early days. And we would, and I think Dougie Fresh was on top of the pop. So we were all trying to beatbox as well. And we were all trying to break when Malcolm McLaren brought Supreme Team yeah. and, and the Rocksteady crew and all, all of those influences. And then the breakdance movie. And I know Wildstar was important for a lot of people, but I missed that at the time. But Beat Street was the one for us. So anyway, that was the, the, the interest in hip hop started there. The interest in photography came 10, 10 plus years later when I started college. And I got into photography and I loved photographing people. And uh, I was only doing a GCSE to fill up hours on my A-levels. And I was walking around the college photographing friends and people around college. And um, 
they had a lab at the college where I could process my film at the end of the day. So it was the closest I could get to instant pictures, right? Because uh, at that stage, if you remember before digital, we had to take it to Boots or, or, or send it to Or Trooper develop it in. yourself. Yeah. And, and also you were trying to finish the film so that you could send it off to get processed. Oh. And, and it was very, very slow. So being able to process after college was nice because I could literally see the pictures the same day. And, and so... Um, yeah, got into that. And then I, w I knew I wanted to work in music. I'd heard about A&R as, as, and, and my understanding was you could go to loads of gigs and find the best bands and sign them to a record label. And that was like, I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be an A&R person. Um, but I was doing photography at the same time. And I, and I hooked up with a guy who wanted to be a journalist and I would tag along and and photograph gigs that uh, and I was going to a lot of clubs myself because I was into the music scene I was going to hip-hop jams and um, uh, and then I found that if I was photographing a concert I could get a free free access go to gigs for free and be at the front I was like this is amazing so <laughs> it was like the two loves came together the hip-hop and the photography mm -hmm. and um, and I needed to do something for a living and it, initially it wasn't my plan to do that for a living. It was I was doing it for fun, and I was doing it because I loved it. And um, and then it came to a point where I decided to take it more seriously. I invested in better equipment, and uh, and then people took me more seriously as a result as well. I mean, I mean, before we get into details with the whole photography side of things, mm. um, you know, I, I want people to get to know you a little bit better. So I, I grew up in a nice-ish area west london we all used to play out on the street uh, my dad worked at the national physics laboratory in teddington and my mum worked next door in the admiralty research laboratory and and a little birdie tells me that you were the next road up from a photo that the beatles had taken <laughs> uh, yeah so uh, the road we lived in in st margaret's in the next street, the Beatles filmed um, a section from one of their movies. I think it was Hard Day's Night. One that one of them films, Beatles films, I can't remember. It's got them coming out of the doorways of uh, Elsa Avenue in St. Margaret's. And also, this, this new doc that's come on Netflix, a lot of it was filmed at Twickenham Studios. And I was literally 10 minutes from there. That was like next to our local church and the, the, the local shops were all... It's still there now. So, so literally, you could have gone to your garden climbed over the wall and you would have been on the street. Although I think that, that might have been the 60s, which is before I was born. Okay, <laughs> but just imagine. Yeah, yeah. Wow. This is the thing. Back then, we all had the same influences. We all watched the same Saturday morning TV. We all saw the news around the Blue Peter. And, and we were all watching. There was only f four channels. Um, and uh, so everyone saw everything at the same time and everyone got into stuff at the same time. That's really interesting because now we're open to so much information mm. and I, I don't know what your perception of it is but my perception is there's too much out there that it gets confusing and a lot of and the, a lot of it isn't even true when i became a bit older teenager and i ha i wanted to have my own interests that were not so mainstream i think this might have been an, another attraction to hip-hop mm. and there was no internet so you couldn't it wasn't so easy to just find information about anything you had to find other routes now, I remember when I started college in London, Tower Records in Piccadilly was like a treasure trove of alternative information. Go down to the basement, they had like a thousand magazines from, and they had all these weird, I remember I used to read 2600 magazine, the Hackers magazine, and, and they, they had all these really unusual magazines in Tower Records, and unusual import records, so you could get it from you, buying certain records, and you'd literally, I'd go through the racks, and I'd read the little reviews that whoever worked there had written, and I might choose something based on that, or you'd go to a record shop, and someone would sell you a record, or you'd hear it, so they, we, we, it was just harder to find different stuff. Now, the internet has just opened that up, so if you want to find something different, uh, it, it, it's all there. Um, obviously, Google and Facebook will push certain things to you based on who's paying what, but uh, you can still find your corner. So it's, it's just the mechanism has changed, and obviously it's become a lot more fragmented. Lots of people are into lots of different things mm -hmm. now. Um, and... Uh, uh, which uh, is good and it's bad, I suppose. It makes some things easier and some things more difficult. It's just change, really. It's, I, 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 don't, I don't say it's worse. It's just, it's just it the way things are. It is what exactly. it is. Exactly. 
like in the schools, you said there was people beatboxing, there was people rapping and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and breaking. I mean, I was, I was, I could do a head spin, <laughs> and that was like uh, everyone wanted to see me do head spin at school, and I remember doing a head spin out on the field, right? Don't ask me. And um, and, and then getting up and, and rubbing my head and having blood all over my hand because <laughs> I wasn't prepared on a stone or something like that. So, yeah, we were into breaking and I could never do proper windmills, though. I always yeah. wanted to be able to windmill. I never could. But we were, we were popping and locking. And so, it was so just it, but, having fun. But the thing is, it was popular. Like, all the kids were seeing the same thing. You know what I mean? So yeah, we popular. used to learn the lyrics to the tracks as well. And um, uh, like Melly Mel, I, I, I learned lyrics to a lot of his songs and then Run DMC later on and, and that kind of so thing. So have, have any of those kids from your area mm. gone into doing anything uh, that we would know about? Oh. Has anyone made any records that made a difference? Anyone turned into a movie star? Do you know what? I don't. There's no one I know from school so got... basically you're saying like you know there's four or five hundred kids in the school and whatever mm. and you're the only one that actually did something with your life no they all <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah yeah that's what i'm saying no 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 that's ridiculous so they, they they all made loads of money i just yeah <laughs> you just became a i just had lots of fun <laughs> okay all right we have something in common that's right and and our noses probably give that away listen the family it's connection, in, yeah, my cousins. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you're Armenian. That's where the Hampart Sumian surname comes from. Okay. Um, uh, oh, here's an interesting thing for you. So growing up, uh, my father was of Armenian heritage. Um, mother's UK, uh, sort of bit Irish, Scottish, Welsh, whatever you call that, English. Confused. Yeah, and um, my kids are confused. <laughs> um, and... Uh, but in primary school, my surname, my mum didn't want me to have difficulties with my surname. So she gave me a shortened version. This, I've never told this in an interview before. So my surname in primary school was Hampson, Paul Hampson, oh, wow. shortened version, right? Then when I started secondary school, um, my mum said, uh, okay, uh, now you start in secondary, do you want to continue using Hampson or do you want to use your full name or your dad's name, Hampart Sumian, which is, uh, I don't even think she said it was Armenian. She just said, this is your, your real name. And I was like, I'm going to use Hampart Sumian like this, <laughs> right? I was like, yeah, I, I, I like that. And it was, looking back on that and thinking about that, not, not all kids would have wanted to stick out in that way because that's what it does. It's just putting a big label on yourself. Look at me, yeah, I've got yeah. a funky surname, yeah, yeah. right? And, um, and you know what kids are like. They'll find any reason to pick on someone. But they didn't pick on me. And, and, or they at least didn't pick on me for my name. Um, other things maybe. But <laughs> not for the name. So, um, and also, there were other kids with crazy long, long ass surnames in, in school. So, um, so anyway, Paul H was just more co for convenience. And actually, Paul H was my DJ name before I was doing photography. So I was, I was DJing. Uh, and doing mobile discos and promoting clubs before I got seriously into the photography. Yeah, we'll, I was doing we'll come to that as well. Yeah, yeah. So. I didn't really know too much about the Armenian heritage at growing up them early years. But then on my first day at secondary school, I'd, I'd in primary school I'd taken part in an art competition, like drawing competition, and um, and I'd won a prize. And so they read out my name in assembly. Mm. They said, uh, following. We'll be going for tea with the mayor who for winning this art competition and uh, Paul Humpa Humpa Pum. <laughs> That's always what happened, right? When the teacher's going through the register and there's a pause, you know they got to my uh, name, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's <yeah>. like <laughs> Humpa Sumi. So anyway, at break time, these two boys came up to me and they said, "What's your name, Humpa Sumi? You're Armenian. We're Armenian. You need to come to Armenian Scouts. You should come to this. You should do uh, this. Uh, you should do that." And that was my first awareness of an Armenian community because mm -hmm. I'd not had any exposure to it. Um, and I didn't go, but they you always used to try and say, come along, come along. And I think they had this Armenian Sunday school where they play basketball and they learn Armenian and da, da, da. And they, there's a group of Armenians in London that kind of grew up knowing each other, but I wasn't really party to that. Until much later, I got, um, I was working in a, uh, the bar at Brentford Leisure Centre and, and then um, they uh, this Armenian group came and they wanted to hire a place for a party 
And I said, oh, I'm mum, you And they said, oh, come to the party. So they invited me and I came and I saw all these people that looked like me. And it was a really, <laughs> really strange experience because I'd not really encountered a large group of Armenians before. And, but, and it felt quite nice. It was like, and they were very welcoming too. And it was really, really nice. Although they kept talking to me in Armenian and I don't speak the language. Yeah. So they were, ah, tuh, you're not a yeah. real Armenian. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone from any kind of minority heritage will have similar experiences, right? Um, and London, that's London, isn't it? If nobody's from, I mean, very few people are fully English, English in London. Everyone's got, even if it's just some Irish or, or whatever, there's very few people that I see that are fully, like both parents are English and all grandparents are uh, from England. How do you think being Armenian uh, affected, um, you know, did it have any kind of effect on the way you got into hip hop? Did, did, did so that's, a, that's a, it's an interesting things. question, right? Because when I look at, prominent Armenian uh, figures uh, in, in various aspects of business. They, they're quite... Armenian people, as you know, we, we, we had to leave our, our, our homeland, so to speak, at the like, beginning of the last century. Do you, do you want to explain a little okay, bit about... Yeah. The Ottoman Empire existed across, across uh, Eastern Europe and uh, from Turkey and Eastern Europe. And um, what happened was the Young Turk government uh, the Armenians lived in uh, Anatolia, which uh, is part of the area. Um, uh, they lived in the region which is now Eastern Turkey and uh, Northern Turkey and, and Armenia. Um, and the, the Armenian people were forcibly removed from Turkey by the um, Turkish uh, Young Turk government. And uh, we were displaced and many, many were killed um, and it's referred to controversially by some um, uh, well uh, it it was a genocide right when you look at the UN definition of genocide they um, they make reference to what happened to the Armenians from 1915 to 1918 right so what had happened so was, it was not too dissimilar to what happened to the Jews really it's funny that you should mention that because um, many would cite uh, Hitler gave a speech to his generals before he invaded Poland and he actually said attack without mercy men women and children for who today remembers the Armenians it was almost like a reference for Hitler before he invaded Poland was look at what happened to the Armenians and they got the, they got away with it right because all the Armenians were gone from eastern Turkey and the, then uh, what happened was the Soviet Union was formed and so Armenia became a state um, after World War One, but prior to that, the Armenian people had just lived uh, in Anatolia. So, so it's almost like what happened to the Armenians was a test run for what happened to the Jews. You could say that, I guess. Yeah. Um, I never saw it that way, but I mean, it's, I'm, there I'm are, thought, no, let me, let me the thing is, that. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, you never thought. There are a lot of similarities. And when I talk about the similarities, like it was the orchestrated nature. Now, the, the, the definition of genocide is that it has to be a, a, a premeditated and deliberate attempt to wipe out a people, either by removing their language, their ability to reproduce. or, or th There are lots of technical uh, legal factors that constitute what is and what isn't genocide. Just killing lots of people isn't classed as genocide. You need to be trying to eradicate them from existence. So basically... April 24th, 1915 was when the Armenian intellectuals and community leaders were rounded up by the Ottoman uh, government in Constantinople and executed. They were part of Turkish society, and, um, but there was mistrust. They were considered other because Armenian uh, religion is Christianity, right? The Armenian Orthodox Church. And um, so there was, there was mistrust like... Um, and basically, they decided that they would remove them. And so my grandfather was a refugee as a boy. And so basically, all the men were executed, and then the women and children were pushed out through the Syrian desert and in various directions from various parts of Asia Minor. And like over a million perished. And the, the shocking, horrific details uh, were recorded and there were a lot of Western observers. There was American observers and British observers recording these events and reporting on them in 
these countries. So I think about my grandfather's situation. He was a boy. He, his mother and his sister died en route. He buried them in the sand. Uh, and then I'm thinking, so hold on. He's, he's like, uh, he's got no home. He's got no country. He's got no family. He's got, he's got, he's got nothing. It's like that's, people think they've got nothing. I'm thinking that's really having nothing, right? And, and so he figured out, he figured it out. Uh, and now I sadly he died before I was born so I never met him so I know the story from my dad but there's not much detail in that story and I, and I, I imagine it would have been hard to speak about anyway right but um, so my grandfather was a refugee he actually went to Cyprus so he got on the boat from southern Turkey went to Famagusta my dad was born in Cyprus I, I remember you sent me a picture I think of your grandfather or great-grandfather Oh, his passport. Yeah, my grandfather. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you mind sharing it for the interview? Yeah. Okay. I'll yeah. send that to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like yeah. it's from know, his passport. I... So I've got the passport that he used to get out of Turkey. That just kind yeah, of sums yeah. Up the well, that makes it real, nicely, and that's yeah. literally all I've got. And yeah. and it shows the stamps in the port in Mersin and in Famagusta and the dates and. And also the, the the thing that I'm really curious about in that passport was that it says that um, the purpose of his voyage was to visit an uncle in Beirut. And now my dad doesn't know anything about any family in Beirut, right? So I don't know. Maybe I've got some family in Beirut. Other history. And we're talking musical now. Mm. LWR. <laughs> so LWR. Okay, right. So... When I was at school and we were into all these things and I mentioned Beat Street and uh, all of these, inf- another big influence was pirate radio, in particular LWR, mm-hmm. because we were looking for, obviously we had some of the pops, but we were looking for something different and we didn't have the internet. So we were, we were scanning, my dad bought us this radio and we were looking for pirate stations and we came across LWR and Tim Westwood was DJing Monday to Friday after school playing hip hop. Uh, when you think about how difficult it was later on to find hip hop on any, uh, there wasn't on any mainstream platform to be able to hear it every day on pirate radio. That was just like, it was incredible, and and we loved it because it was our thing as well. It was like nobody, like only the people who knew about it were yeah. listening to it. It was yeah. your thing to be into, right? And like he would give all his updates on this event and that event and break records. And we were learning. So we learned from Beat Street. We learned from Subway Art and we learned from radio. And uh, pirate radio, I think, has been the backbone of so many scenes. Like it was the backbone for hip hop for us. But then it became that backbone of the raves. And before that, reggae, I think the DBC in uh, uh, Labrick Grove, which I think Lepke set up, was one of the first pirate reggae stations playing reggae when there was no reggae on mainstream radio and then hip-hop in the 80s and uh, and then house music in the late 80s and then jungle and all of them scenes they all thrive before the internet all of these scenes thrive through pirate radio and i think pirate radio often doesn't get sufficient recognition for its part in all of these scenes i would i would like to find some uh, someone who was involved in actually going up to those um, Tower blocks. And I did that too. Gosh, know, so. I went to a couple of stations, and it was just so exciting. Just yeah. going in the tower block, knocking on the old man's flat, who direct you into the little room, and yeah. like there'd be the clock and the rules on the no politics, no religion, no swearing. And um, you know what I liked about pirate radio was that when when you listen to the mainstream radio, it's like everyone's playing the same records. Mm. And with pirate radio, you didn't get that. Yeah, that exactly. You know, yeah, so yeah. You know, there was no play, not playlisting in the same way that Capital Radio or Radio One might have had. And I remember my first time going up to, uh, I think it was Green Apple in uh, Greenford or somewhere like that. So my, my fr- a friend of mine took me to this station, and we went in this tower block, and he had me on, and they had a mobile phone, but it was one of them big old big handle box mobile phones and he had me answering the phone and taking the shout outs and uh, and saying them on the radio and that was so exciting that whole pirate scene how, how important do you think um tim westwood was in the build-up of uh, hip-hop scene here what i'm saying now is that he was a significant factor in my exposure to hip-hop in the early 80s yeah i, I think so too and um you know, I know, I know he gets his slack sometimes from people and whatever, but I, you know, I feel like I got opportunities because of his support. I, I don't want to get too much into Westwood because I'm sure we could talk about him all day. Yeah. There's, there's a thousand stories, right? But 
he stuck with hip hop. Now there were a lot of DJs were into hip hop in the early eighties, and then they moved on. And then when the late eighties, and there were big name house DJs that started off playing hip hop. Yeah, John Lewis, um, Garage, everything. And, and uh, I'm not, I'm not going to mention their names, but if you look at the histories of all the big house DJs, a lot of them were playing hip hop and, and into hip hop. And... Yeah. West would just stuck with the hip hop. You got into DJing. You also had a job in a hi-fi store. Yeah. Um, you worked with mobile discos and you DJed at leisure centers and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So, but I also understand that um, your musical background wasn't just hip hop. When I started DJing, it was um, I would play for the crowd. So um, I I got some work because I'd been working in the bar at the leisure center and then. They used to have these roller discos, and I'd approached the the um, uh, someone at the council and said, "Can I DJ for these?" And so I got a gig playing for these roller discos at Brentford Fountain Leisure Centre twice a month, and I started advertising the Thompson Local Directory. Okay. So to do birthdays and weddings wow. and all that kind of thing, and literally, and then I needed the old, I needed the sixties, I needed a bit of rock and roll, I needed a bit of disco, and I, I needed the eighties pop mm -hmm. and the wham and the Madonna and the, all all of that stuff. So I was literally playing across the board for for parties, and it was like it was a hobby, but it was a business, right? Because I, and and I was getting getting paid to do it. Because I mean, it was an expensive hobby, right? So I would use the money that I would earn to buy more records and. And likewise with photography, all the money was to Cameras buy film and, film and lenses and, what, yeah. and, cam and all of it. So I wasn't getting rich, and but I was building up a lot of gear, equipment, and uh, and experience. And obviously, through experience, you you improve as well. Would you would you say the experience is more valuable than the money? Don't get me wrong, right? Money's important. Money opens a lot of doors and creates opportunities and gives you choices. Gives you a lot of choices about stuff. Sometimes. You don't want to do stuff, but you've got to do it because you're going to earn money, right? But like, you, you don't have to, uh, you, can, you can embrace that thing or you can do it grudgingly. And like, if you do it grudgingly, then you never, it, nothing good comes from it. If you, if you put everything into whatever you're doing, whether it's sweeping the floor, or, I mean, you've heard all this. Sort yeah, of we've done it. So we've been there and everything. So, you know, we've had conversations in the past and I find your story really interesting with how you got into photography. So how I got into, so like I said, I, I was at college and I was studying photography and da, da, da. But then the music came along uh, or, or the music photography came about by accident because I, I was uh, I was promoting parties and I was, um, um, I was a, became an entertainment officer at my, at London College of Printing. And then I started promoting some club nights um, and, and parties. And we went on this training session and... Um, in Oxford that was arranged by the student union and uh, there was a guy there who was interviewing the James Taylor Quartet who were performing and um, he saw that I had a camera with me and asked if I'd take some pictures for his college newspaper so I did so that was Jake Barnes the journalist and um, I took the photos and they went in his college newspaper that was my first published picture in what the James Taylor Quartet? James Taylor Quartet. Wow. So I was into hip hop, but I was into the acid jazz and funk yeah, yeah. scene as well because I, when I understood about breaks and and the music behind hip hop, it got me into that music as well. So I got into James Brown because of hip hop. Mm -hmm. Like hip hop brought a lot of people to James Brown. And, yeah. But um, I saw him uh, at Essential Festival once, photographed in there. I remember I took pictures from from. We couldn't even get in the pit, I think. So I got some from the back. And then I tried to get into the the enclosure and security just stopped me. And I said, look, this is James Brown. I had to get some pit. They weren't having it. And I was the, it was often, it was so frustrating sometimes when you had restrictions as a photographer. Now, like PRs and security can sometimes, well, security can view photographers as pests, right? Because they're just trying to sneak here and be where they're not supposed to be. But I was thinking about like I'm recording history, right? This is this is a moment in time which if I don't if I don't get it, it didn't happen, right? So I, I'm attaching this importance to what I'm doing because you're writing history and like with my own history and the fact that so much of it is is not recognised because the difference you you mentioned you compared the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide genocide and the difference between those was the media. Uh, and 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 um, 
uh, film and photography and there was much less of that in 1915 yeah. and so although a lot of stuff was recorded it's the imagery that's powerful mm. um, and uh, so when I'm trying to get a picture of uh, at an event and I'm, I might be trying to cheeky hustle to get into where I'm not supposed to be I don't feel bad about that because I feel that what I'm doing has a greater importance than I'm not just there for fun right I'm working and I'm doing something important and I've 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 got pictures in situations where nobody else got pictures and if I didn't get those pictures that, that those moments will be forgotten when then people are gone they it's like they never happened well, see, that's one of the things I really respected and admired and liked about you. The fact that you were willing to go above and beyond to get into situations. Mm -hmm. But there, there are them times as well. Like, I, I put a picture on my Insta the other day of a picture I took of TLC mm -hmm. in London. Now, you know TLC never played in London, right? Mm -hmm. But they came on stage with Jodeci. So I was shooting the Jodeci gig and... Um, there were always restrictions on photography, right? And like after a few songs, we got kicked out of the pit. And um, and then uh, midway through the show, I'm watching the show, TLC come on stage. It's when Waterfalls was at its peak and everyone was going, man, I was like, oh my God, I have to get some pictures. <laughs> so I ran down with my camera right? and I got to the pit and the security stopped me. I said, no, no, it's all right. And I just walked <laughs> past him and he just, while he was thinking about it, I was gone, right? And so I was in the pit because the thing is, when I was by myself, there was no other photographers there. Like, he didn't want to get in trouble, probably. I'd exuded that um, importance to what I was there to do, to capture this moment. Because there you were no know, other photographers, right? You know what, you know what it sounds TLC, like? See, it was the first time on stage in London, right? You, you mastered the art of conning the security into believing <laughs> you're something special. <laughs> It wasn't a con though. It was something special. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, you, I believed you made it. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so here's the thing. So I come in the pit and I take a couple of bits of them, right? And then there's this guy sitting in the pit and he taps me on the shoulder and I look at him, right? So he looked American for some reason. I can't remember what it was, maybe the way he was dressed and he just shook his head like that. And I was like, yeah. that is American. But I'd already took a couple of pictures. So I just sat down in the pit and he was sitting there. And, and then TLC got out these platinum discs to present to Jodeci. And I looked at him like this, and he's like, I can't go. <laughs> so I got up and I took some more pictures, right? And, and, and I'm buzzing, right? I'm yeah. excited. I'm yeah. just, this is TLC. Da, 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 da. Yeah. And I was in love with Lisa, as yeah, everyone yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. Next thing, right? They go off the stage. Next thing, they're standing next to me in the pit, right? And the crowd are all getting, trying to get autographs. I'm like, Oh my God, they're all here. They're all here. And I'm thinking, and I, so I went over and said, excuse me, do you mind if I get a picture? And they said, yeah, sure. So I've got that picture. And that's the picture that's on my Insta. On your Insta. And so I've got that picture. But the point is, I've never seen any pictures of TLC in London, mm. anywhere, so ever. Got... Sorry. And after I took that picture, <laughs> this, the head of security grabbed me, physically pulled me. He's like, what are you doing here? I said, just taking some pictures. He's like, you're not supposed to be. He dragged me out of the pit, right? Yeah. And the guy who did initially let me in, um, the head of security shouts, saying, what are you, why are you letting photographers in here? And he's like, uh, and so I leave, the, they start arguing, so I just sneak <laughs> off like this. <laughs> I go into this, they go through this door. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm backstage. I go in through this door and I walk into this bar and I see he's 17 and eternal. And everybody's like, all these, Pop yeah, stars like yeah. sitting around. So I just go up to the bar and I ordered a drink and I sit there and I'm just like, uh, my heart is like racing because like I had the pictures. I, I, I was I was really hot, but it was just a really calm environment. I'm sitting there sipping my drink with all the pop stars. Yeah. And um, and meanwhile, security are having a big row outside. <laughs> so so it, it would be fair to say that if I was to say to you, who have you taken pictures of? Mm. It'd probably be fair to say, who haven't you taken pictures of? Yeah, so I'd never had the opportunity to photograph Tupac. Okay. Um, he never came to the UK mm -hmm. that I'm aware of. And I never went to the West Coast um, while he was around. And in hip hop, I pretty much photographed everyone. Uh, so you got Jay-Z, Beyonce, Jay and everybody. So Jay, uh, actually, here's another historical moment, which I need to try and contact them about. Because when he played the Royal Albert Hall, so it was just following that beef with Nas, um, and I remember I really want. he was doing two gigs. He was doing Royal Albert Hall and he was doing 
Forum? No. I can't remember. It was doing another venue. I can't remember. So uh, anyway, the girl from the label said to me, ask me, can I shoot for Jay? Right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, at the Royal Albert Hall. She said, you'll be the only photographer. And I'm like, just <laughs> flipping it. How much do I pay for this honor, right? Because I'm a fan too. And so, um, yeah, they booked me to shoot as the only photographer that, for that Royal Albert Hall show, Jay and Beyonce, and, and, and unannounced surprise guest was Nas. Right? Oh, wow. So Nas comes on stage and stands this next to This is why they Jay. got issues. Just, just well, after. They, they got to, yeah, okay, they okay. kind of made up and they just stood next to each other with a hand like that. And everyone's going, oh, right. nobody knew Nas yeah. was there. Yeah. And so, they, what, what was that? Was that like a they symbol were, of they, like, they were just standing like that. Like, and and, and uh, Nas had that big uh, Egyptian sort of uh, Tutankhamun uh, chain mm. and, and they were just stood like that. And everyone's, ah, like, so I got all the pictures of that. That was mad. Okay. And obviously, it was Beyonce was on stage as well. And, and, and actually, that show. You had on the bill, you had Kano, you had Lupe Fiasco, you had Rick Ross, he was brand new, uh, and uh, and Jay and Nas and Beyonce and Chris Martin randomly yeah. on the set, and Gwyneth Paltrow sang someone happy birthday, I think. It was a lot of odd stuff. And uh, so, anyway, after the gig, I'm in the uh, corridor backstage, and uh, I, th I did some pictures of Lupe with. Uh, and I'm a big fan of Lupe Fiasco, right? He's like he's a he's an MC who's literally transcribed my thoughts on some of his records. Like when I hear his records, I'm like, "How did you read my mind?" Like, and I told him as well, and I shot him. But anyway, I took some pictures of him with Jay and I put him with Nas, and um, I'll come back to that. But then Jay's PA uh, a bit later on, she said, "Paul, do you want to come in the dressing room?" And I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> She's like, "Hold on." She went in the dressing room and she came out. She said, okay, but you can't publish the pictures. And I'm like, fine, right? Because it's recording history still, right? So I went in the dressing room. So Jay and I stand there with their bottles of Krug champagne and, and there's John Manili and there's like all, all of his crew. And there's not a lot of people in the room, like 10 people in the room, right? And so I'm there, I get a couple of pictures. Like Door opens, Beyonce comes in with her video camera in her hand with me standing in front of it. So like, I'm like, <laughs> on their own video, right? And like, Jay and I like, whoa, like that. And so I got this wide shot of Jay uh, and all the guys waving their hands up and Beyonce with a big smile on her face with a video camera in there. And that picture's never been published. And I promised I wouldn't. And so until I, unless, unless I could get permission, it's still sitting at home. But, but like, that's, again, that was recording history and it wasn't for the news and like the pictures of the show went out and they were in the news they were in the press and it was big a uh, big story and whatever but yeah being in them kind of situations where you can witness like the real experience like it was a natural moment it wasn't for the cameras it wasn't for the show yeah. and um and then uh, mentioning the, the lupe pitch. so a couple of years later i went to a lupe gig at coco and um I went to his dressing room afterwards and I give him this envelope and I said, go, Lupe, he said, what's this? And so he takes it out and it's the pictures of him and Jay and Nas at the Royal Albert Hall. It's like, oh my God, thank you so much. He was really happy. Yeah. He's like, sign them for me. I'm like, don't be silly. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, you've got to sign them. So I'm like, to Lupe. Okay, <laughs> this is mad. backwards, man. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah it's weird. But, and, and also because I'm such a big fan of these guys as artists, just... Being a part of that experience is, is, is the best job in the world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, because I've known you for so many years, I hear these stories and I just, I'm fascinated by the amount that you've actually done and people don't even know. So anyway, now, now I'm going to go on to something that has always been like one of those wow moments for me, mm. right? And uh, I'm just going to say this and you just take it where you want to take it. All right. Hiphop.com. What would you like to know? <laughs> so, okay, so I'm just going to throw figures out there. I've heard so, so many ridiculous figures and whatever that people have said that a certain well-known celebrity has approached you and offered you millions and all kinds of stuff and whatever. Obviously, I've explained how I was into music, I was into photography. Mm. I was also really into the internet. When I discovered the internet and I got Netscape 2 on my old Apple Mac Quadra and a uh, 14.4 modem. They were brand new. They were the fast ones at that time. And um, 
and discovered the World Wide Web and just literally from my first dial-up account uh, and surfing the web all night, like till, till the sun came up, just exploring using Lycos and Alta Vista search engines and all of this stuff and just, just the mind-boggling experience that was finding the World Wide Web and thinking of all the possibilities and, and then shortly afterwards building my own website, writing a web page with some hot links and some uh, various bits and pieces and then moving from that into um, sort of interactivity, putting guest books on and, and, and then very quickly turning that into work, right? So this was, I've always turned all my hobbies into work, right? My hobby was music, I did the DJ. My hobby was photography, I did the photography. My hobby was the internet, I, I started, what I did was I called up my ISP and I said, let me come work for you, uh, do some work experience. And they're like, we don't need anyone. I'm like, listen, I'll make the tea. And they're like, well, no, we don't need anyone. I said, look, just one day a week, uh, let me come in, I'll make the tea, I'll sweep up, whatever you need me to do. I literally pestered these people, right, just because I want to be in the environment, I want to learn about the, 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 the thing. And like, there was nowhere to learn about the internet. It was just, so anyway, they let me go. And so I, I, I got in the door, started making myself useful. What I ended up doing was writing documentation for their customers of how to do stuff. But as I learned it, so I'd say, how do I do this? They'd explain it. I'd write it out. I'd turn it into a how-to and put it on their website. So I made myself useful real quick. I was doing that for nothing. And then I got a job and I was earning £125 a day writing web pages, right? From literally from working for free. And uh, so that was exciting. So I bought lots of camera gear with, with the money I was earning. And, um, but I was working in this internet company who were building websites for um, a few things which are now gone. But um, uh, they were also developing new web technologies which are commonplace today. So I was involved in all of that. And I was curious about web addresses because you had all different kinds of internet web addresses and 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 domain names weren't a big thing so i i i i learned about domain names and uh and i thought and i'm into hip-hop and i'm into photography and i'm into the internet i'm gonna if i register hiphop.com then i can use that for my photography so hiphop.com was the merger of all my loves really yeah, yeah. it was supposed to be the showcase for my photography and in 1996 i sent a fax to Internic and bank transferred a hundred dollars to register hiphop.com. Right? There was only one internet registrar. You couldn't check the availability of the domain name on the web. You had to do it with Telnet. You telnet rs.internic.net who is hiphop.com. Yeah, da, 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 da. yeah. So so I registered hiphop.com and uh the, I, I had various plans and, and my mind was just going in a million directions. I had so many ideas for things to do on the internet um, and, and because it was the interactive element of it that excited me. And um, um, so, yeah, I built up various things and hiphop.com over the years was up and down. It was like, uh, I told you the story how at one point it was the busiest website for my ISP and it was using all their bandwidth and they contacted me and said... Um, you need to pay. Uh, you're using all, all. You're using all our bandwidth, and uh, like more than all our other customers put together, and you have to pay us for it. It's going to be twelve grand a month. And I didn't have no money, and I wasn't making no money. And I said, so I went to see them. And I said, Look, and I explained. And they said, well, you're going to have to do something because you can't continue using all our bandwidth. <laughs> so uh, I I tried to get some ad revenue, but companies were not spending money on ads like they are now on the internet and there were no internet departments and da, 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 and couldn't figure that out so i had to shut it out, down which was sad okay. like, so so what was um the involvement with this certain celebrity we're talking about various people were offering me uh, asking to to making me offers to buy hiphop.com regularly right they were uh, I, was, I was getting emails every day. Do you want to sell it? I didn't want to sell it. I, was, I didn't want to sell it for any money. I was like, this is what I want to do, right? You can give me all money in the world, but I still, this is what I want to do. So, and this can make loads of money if I do it right, right? So, um, so I, I, I kept uh, sticking at it, trying different things, whatever. And my problem, and it was, it's not a bad problem to have, but I, it was too busy. Like when Google started, because Google didn't exist in the 90s, obviously, 
hiphop.com was always number one on Google. So I was getting mad, mad traffic all the, way, the time. The way this is going, I'm amazed you didn't start Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, um, yeah, one of, one of the most sort of notable that people talk about, obviously, I got approached by Russell Simmons uh, when he got into his internet phase um, and his lawyer approached me first and then uh, arranged a phone call and uh, he wanted to wanted to do something or buy hiphop.com and uh, I remember talking to him and him explaining to me about what he did and what he'd done and I said Russell you don't need to explain I know who you are and and he said yeah come to New York come next week come next week and we can we can we can hang out and da, 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 da. it was all very exciting but I didn't want to go to New York like that. I, I think it was just before Christmas I didn't want to go at that time so anyway I didn't go then he made me an offer um, I wasn't interested for all the reasons I explained. It was a decent offer, um, but that's what I wanted to do, and I didn't follow that up. You were in talks with certain other people on and off, uh, trying to find out whether you should. I, I didn't know how Russell had got my number, and I think I saw Westwood at something, and uh, I said, Tim, did you give Russell Simmons my telephone number? And he looks at me, he's like, Russell Simmons called you? I said, yeah. He said, why? I said, he wants to buy hiphop.com. He said, oh, don't sell it, don't sell it. <laughs> but he didn't give him my number. Anyway, yeah. And then uh, I think Lance Rivera called me as well. Mm. And that was a weird one because Lance Rivera ran Entertainment Records, which signed Charlie Baltimore and uh, Cameron. And uh, he was the one that got stabbed by Jay-Z when, oh. when he bootlegged Jay-Z's stuff. Wow. Right? And, um, and that was almost the end for Jay-Z. Uh, and Jay talks about that in his book, Decoded. Anyway... Lance Rivera called me and I didn't know the guy at all I didn't even know what he looked like but I knew his name because I'd heard these stories and obviously and I photographed Cameron and they'd had the showcase at Planet Hollywood and um anyway um Lance Rivera was just like yeah here's all my numbers here's my beeper here's my cell here's my home call me let's work something out let's do something I'm like how did this guy get my number I don't know how these people got my number but Someone said, yeah, everyone in New York's talking about you. Oh, I don't know if that's true or not. But, <laughs> but Russell had called, Lance had called, and other people had called. And I was getting all these emails. I didn't want to sell it. It was that oh, yeah. simple, really. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to do it. Um, and that's why I'm always slightly reserved about it, because it, it, never, it never achieved the potential I felt it was capable of at that time. Mm. And I guess I was the problem, really. I mean, Do you regret it? No, 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 I don't regret it because I still had all the same experiences. Okay, things could have been different, but like um, uh, it didn't stop me doing what I was doing. And, um, but do you think it would have changed your life at any point? Well, who knows? And anyway, I still own it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's not like I'm doing nothing with it. I've done this deal with Universal yeah. and they're doing a great job. They're running this online store and I'll be... Uh, in the new year, getting um, some of my own stuff in the store as well. Okay. So that's an outlet. And I mean, Universal's not a bad partner, right? Yeah, the biggest course. label in the world. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. like, look at their roster. Look yeah. who's on Universal. It's like, could be worse, right? Yeah, yeah, of I could have sold it, spent the money, and be back where I am with nothing. You told me a little story about a situation in Dubai. <laughs> to do with this. this is another hiphop.com story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I remember one time I was going to Dubai to photograph Kanye at the Desert Rhythm Festival. And I was with a group of journalists in the airport and I'm chit chatting with one guy. And uh, he said, oh, so What do you do? Who do you work for? And I worked for Hip Hop Connection magazine, as you know. So I said, Yeah, I shoot hip hop acts and da da da. And he's like, Oh, have you heard? Them? That website, hiphop.com, the guy, the guy who owns it is from the UK. I'm like, really? He said, yeah. And Russell Simmons called him and offered him like five million to sell it. And I was like, no, no, it wasn't five million. He's like, what? I said, because the guy is me. <laughs> and it wasn't five million. <laughs> and, um, and I pulled out my business card and I said, look at my email address. And he's like, Really? I was like, <laughs> that was funny. You mentioned Hip Hop Connection. Yeah. Now, the thing is, um, obviously, I met you because we were doing photos at Hip Hop Connection, but, you know, we, we also had that connection of the Armenian thing when we first met. Yeah, we yeah. Well, I remember and, the first time I saw you, because yeah. when I first heard about Blade, like, someone said to me, this, this guy's Armenian, you know, and, and I didn't know. 
And I, I remember looking at the cover of, was it Mind of an Ordinary Citizen? The, the police car. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, and, and having the, my friend tell me about you as this Armenian rapper. And I, was, I felt really proud that I was not alone. Because I didn't know any Armenians, right? And, and just seeing that there was a rap artist, a successful UK rap artist who, who sold his record on Street Corners and Groove. <laughs> like, uh, and, and cool too. I, was, I, was, I, felt, I felt a little bit of pride there. When I think about those situations, um, I've had people saying to me, you must be the only Armenian rapper I've ever heard of. Mm. Like, so, so many people have said, I must be the first ever mm. Armenian rapper. Mm. So I'm wondering if you're the first ever Armenian hip hop photographer. Do you know what? There's a there's an Armenian hip hop photographer in the US now who's yeah. really good and doing really really well. Like, but uh, was he the first? Though? No, no, he so didn't, you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I tell you what, I was talking with James Peltekian the other okay. day. He's the party photographer for the for the Evening Standard, okay. and like another Armenian photographer. He tells me about all kind. You know, on the five pound note, that picture of um, Winston Churchill. Yeah, yeah. That's an Armenian photographer took that. Oh, really? And he's, Churchill's sitting there and he snatched his cigar out of his mouth and took the picture. And that's why Churchill looked so grumpy in the picture. Because he didn't want him to have a cigar in the picture. Right? And you see, um, you know there's, a, there's an Armenian community in Ethiopia, right? Okay, I didn't know. Because um, uh, Haile Selassie visited Armenia. All right. And, uh, and he adopted like 30 or 40 Armenian orphans and brought them to Addis Ababa. And they did music and art and stuff in Ethiopia. And there's pictures of Haile Selassie and his queen taken by an Armenian photographer. Wow. There's, a, there's a famous picture of them that's taken by an Armenian photographer. And there's still an Armenian community in Addis Ababa now. Mm -hmm. And I only learned about this recently. Do you remember what your first ever picture was published in Hip Hop Connection? I talked about the journalist and I used to tag along and follow him to gigs and interviews and whatever. And then that helped me establish the link with Andy Cowan, the editor of Hip Hop Connection. And because I was going to all the hip hop jams, I would call him and say, can I photograph this? Can I get access to that? And so he would give me the nod and then I could get a photo pass. And I think the first picture that I got uh, published was of uh, Michael Franti from Spearhead. I was able to borrow some money and buy a Canon EOS 5, amazing like um, electronic autofocus camera, which really improved my pictures. And, um, and I did, I photographed Craig Mack at Subterranea. And that picture ran full page in Hip Hop Connection. I was so thrilled. So that was um, your first That was full my page. first full, full page, page picture. Okay. And then shortly after that, I photographed the Wu-Tang gig at the island in Ilford, but actually, it was supposed to be Wu-Tang, but it was only ODB and I think Killer Priest. And, um, um, and that ran, I think, double page spread. And then Andy told me, send us an invoice. And I'm like, I'm getting paid too? <laughs> uh, again, I took the next step in photography. I bought a Mamiya RZ, uh, RB67 medium format camera because I knew that was the next level from 35 millimeters. So 35 mil was good for, for gigs and clubs and parties and whatever. But in the studio... If you wanted, to, if you were serious, use medium format because the film is like four times the size. The quality is four times better, um, but it's a lot more cumbersome and and uh, it's all manual. And um, so anyway, I bought that camera and uh, I told Andy I bought this camera, and he said, "Okay, can you go and shoot Chuck D?" <laughs> I was like, "Oh my god!" So I did so, a so, shoot with Chuck D, and that was really exciting. So, and then and then after I'd done that, he said, "Okay, I need you to do the cover with Foxy Brown." Oh, this is what 96 i guess and here's the thing like um he said you need to do it in studio you need to book a studio i'd never used a studio i'd used the studio in my gcse photography we'd had one or two lessons with a studio set up that was all i knew about the studio and and he wanted me to do a studio shoot for the front cover with a camera that i'd only just got right <laughs> and i was there i said yeah yeah sure no problem i didn't know what i was doing and um, so I was super nervous. And so I, I called a photographer I knew who did studio photography and he let me come along on a shoot with him. So I kind of absorbed as much as I could of how to do everything. And then and, uh, I asked a couple of people's advice and they gave me a lot of tips. And then I found this studio in Lebrook Grove and, I, and I, I explained to the guy, I didn't really know what I was doing, but <laughs> could he help me? And so I hired the lights and the, and the studio. And anyway, Foxy Brown comes on the day, right? And um, 
so I, I'm setting up and I'm checking everything. And this, this is just after she played at Carnival. It was funny because J. Rue had played the previous year, right? And this is the same time that J. Rue's One Day had come out. And um, uh, I'd heard One Day. Uh, no, I hadn't heard One Day. I heard about One Day. So uh, where J. J. Rue was basically cussing Puffy and Fox, mentioned Puffy and Foxy. And, um, and uh, I remember... Foxy's brother had said F. J. Ru on stage at Carnival and everyone was booing because mm. the last the previous year J. Ru had uh, tore it up at Carnival. Yeah. And so when we're in the studio, I'm talking to Pretty Boy, who's her brother, and I said, Why did you say that about uh uh why did she say that about uh J. Ru? And he said, Oh, have you heard J. Ru's record? I said, No, I haven't. He said, Oh, have a listen. <laughs> he had the tape, right? So he pulled the tape, he put it on. And it's one day, it's the first time I'm hearing one day, and I'm like, bobbing my head, I was yeah, like, not listening to the lyrics. And I'm like, this is dope. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but why do you have to say that about Foxy? <laughs> we don't even know him. And he seemed like they were genuinely hurt yeah. by it. And um, uh, and so I felt a bit bad for them. And, um, and also, she was a child, man. She was like yeah. 15 or 16. She yeah. didn't know anything. And, um, and also, she was a pawn in the game too, right? Russell had signed her. He'd entertained her and brought her to death. Because I think Russell and Puff had both tried to sign her. Because mm. Jay had been writing her lyrics, right? right, right. And um, so anyway, she gets in front of the camera. And I'm, I'm super nervous. So I'm checking everything, taking a meter reading, checking focus, checking the aperture, checking the shutter speed, checking the lights. I'm really, I don't want to fuck this up, right? So I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to mess this up. So I'm checking everything. And she's like, can't you just go snap, snap, snap? <laughs> and I, I, was, I was like, ah. so I just looked at her and said, do you want to look good? <laughs> she's like, yeah. I said, let me do it my way. <laughs> so she just shut up. I was just do it. Yeah. And I took the picture there. And they, they were all fine. And that was my first front cover yeah. for Hip Hop Connection. Music Mag was before that, wasn't it? At the beginning, I was shooting everything black and white, negative. And then I went to see the guy who was uh, doing pictures, for uh, the picture editor for this new music magazine called Music with a Z. And, okay. and uh, he asked me to shoot this uh, club. And I, I'd taken pictures. And they were, they were not very good. And he, he, he said... Uh, he said, have you considered buying an a electronic autofocus camera? <laughs> and like very, very politely telling me that all my good. pictures are out of focus and yeah. uh, badly exposed. And I was like, they cost an arm and a leg. And uh, he said, well, how serious are you? And that was what made me think I need to take this seriously and buy a decent camera. But one of those decisions that... Yeah, 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 that was a pivotal moment. From my perspective, I really appreciate everything that you've done for me. So I'm sure that there are a lot of artists out there that appreciate you for what you've done for them as well. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, like the whole point of the channel is to bring people like you in as well and to basically put people like you in the forefront a little bit to say, look, without these guys, there would be a whole missing context. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I appreciate you for everything. One thing you... I would like to say to you and really to all the people on the scene is that my favorite part of working for Hip Hop Connection was doing the front section. You know, the out and about mm. it was in the clubs it was in the gigs and it was my excuse to go to everything right so i um i mean i went to an inordinate number of gigs and clubs like and often two or three in a night and i was out all the time because i loved it and i loved the scene and i loved the people and i loved the music and the thing that made that possible was everyone letting me take their photo because i recognize that Someone's given me something when I take their photo, right? And uh, it, I mean, it's a two-way thing, but uh, I was able to do that, do all those pictures because of the, 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 the generosity well, of you, those people. Well, so, you kind of became the furniture with the scene, really. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so people well, people would see. say, you're at everything. And, yeah. but, I, but I was trying to be at everything. That was my intention. I need to be at everything. You've taken photos of Eternal, Guru... <laughs> Wu Tang, um, J. Ru, Eminem, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, every, everyone everybody. from the, in that period. Everybody. I did anyone that came to the UK if they were in London, and even if they weren't, I, I went out of London as well. I shot everyone. You used to be a black cabbie, if I recall. No, no, no. I had a black taxi as my car. Okay. Um, <laughs> I wasn't a cabbie. Okay. Uh, so 
when I did the mobile discos, I needed, I didn't want to get a van. Um, so I got this black taxi because it could carry all my disco equipment in the back <laughs> of it, right? And, and that was, it was like a bit of a trademark as well. Um, I used to drive around in the cab and like when I go to gigs, um, we used to, I remember taking the mud fam <laughs> or give them a lift home back to North London after gigs and they'd all be piling to the back, loads of them freestyling and smoking and everything and it was great fun and I always thought I should video like I think I have got some video of skinny freestyling in the back of the cab once. Oh, man. and I was thinking this, this could be a show I should do this regular like just get people perform in the cab and um and then when Twang did the Detwork Southeast video he asked me if um you could use my cab for that <laughs> and uh if you watch the video you'll see they're sitting in the back of my cab and you know it's my cab because the ceiling was torn and it was a little bit of the ceiling was hanging down and every time I watch it I see it and I remember that um uh, yeah uh, I was driving I was driving throughout the whole day as they were shooting the video and then they said oh let Gordon drive for a couple of minutes and they filmed him and that's the bit they used in the video so in the video it looks like Gordon was driving but I was driving I mean, what is the most memorable moment that you had in the cab yeah Berry Crew, Mud Family. I'd be at Subterranea and then I'd say, you guys want to lift? And they'd literally just pile in. There was one seat at the front, so one person would sit in the front. Okay. And it was just like a, a party. <laughs> that would have been a crazy energy. Yeah, it was. Them, I mean, because them guys were lively back they were then as well. And do you know what I loved about them guys? Yeah. I mean, they were always great to photograph. Yeah. Like, and Skinny would round them up um, for a picture. Now, uh, people don't realise, but... It's quite hard taking pictures in a club of people in a club mm -hmm. because you're very conspicuous walking around with a camera so everyone can see you. And I'll always ask people before I take the picture. And if you go up and you say, do you mind if I take a picture? And they, don't, and they say no. It's, you feel like everyone's watching you. It's like, look, shame. Like that. And so you walk off and then you ask the next person. After you get a few of those rejections, it's, it's really, really difficult. Yeah. So when you had people like Skinny who would say yeah yeah and bring everyone in and make it lively and pose and whatever i would always get a great picture mm. and the thing is everyone else saw it so it would be like a starting point so For it, everyone else yeah, yeah yeah and um because some people will say no just because they don't want to be self-conscious mm -hmm. because they're feeling self-conscious about being photographed in the club because they can see everyone's watching as well mm. so um uh yeah, it's, it, those guys in particular really helped me in those situations. I think I've told Skinny as well. Thanks for for them times that you do would. You wanna, do you want to look at the camera? Yeah, thank you, Skinny, <laughs> for all the times you brought the troops together for a picture. Amazing. Um, and and um, and they were. It was a great. I loved that section of the magazine. People in the clubs because I could literally put Mariah Carey next to like Big P and Scheme. It was like literally we had the proper like uh, UK scene and the big international mega stars like all on the, the same platform in that section of the magazine. Hip Hop Connection started in 1988, a few months before The Source. So for many years, it was the, the longest running hip hop magazine, it was the oldest hip hop magazine. Now, I don't know if there were any other magazines that were before that maybe came and went, but I know that Hip Hop Connection ran continuously from 1988 uh, into 2000s. And the only other magazine that was running that long was The Source, but Hip Hop Connection started before The Source. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, yeah, it was, it was the, the longest running hip hop mag. And before it was the magazine, it was the telephone line. Okay. So when Dave Pierce was involved, mm -hmm. um, they, there was a telephone line, it was called Hip Hop Connection, okay. and it was a premium rate phone number, and you phone up, and you would hear the winner of last week's rap competition, <laughs> and then you would record your own rap, uh -huh. and then the winner would get played on the, the following week. And then- That's amazing. Uh, so who's, whose idea was that? Was it before Andy Carpenter you know, came along? Uh, so Andy was not in charge, I think it was a guy called Chris Hunt, mm -hmm. Um, and I've met him, but I didn't really know him, but I think he was the first editor of Hip Hop Connection, or I'm not sure if he was the editor or the publisher. And then Andy, I think, worked on it, but he wasn't the editor. And then Andy later on became the editor. And when I started, 
much later, like 95 mm -hmm. or whenever it was that I first approached them, then uh, Andy was the editor. You uh, took a photo of Flavor Flav. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, so I, but I understand there was a bit of a mistake in um, there somewhere. So Flav, uh, obviously I shot Public Enemy uh, on multiple occasions, but uh, one time I shot Flav for the front cover. And, um, and they, uh, you'll see it on my Instagram, Paul Hip Hop. And a um, little plug there. Uh, but there's this picture of Flav, and it's like a close-up of his face, and he's baring his teeth. It's his flavor Flav on his teeth. And then I think I saw him another time, and I asked him to sign that cover for me. And I asked him, why has it got an E in Flav on your teeth? And he said that the, the guy made a mistake. <laughs> this is a mistake in his teeth. But, uh, yeah. And that's the world to and see. <laughs> you were, you'd never notice if you were just talking to him or uh, you saw him on stage. But obviously, because I had that frozen image of him uh, showing uh, the whole thing, uh, I was like, hold on, why does it say F-L-A-V-E? <laughs> Do you think anyone else spotted that? Um, I don't know, maybe. Because I've seen that cover and I never it spotted now. it. <laughs> I mean, it was only when you told me about it. Yeah. But also, the other thing that I didn't spot was um, that he was wearing a different color hat. Uh, cap. They did, that was just the design. So, um, yeah, he was wearing an orange hat, but they wanted the masthead of the magazine to be orange, so they changed it. That's just designers, man. They, they like to put their... Put their... So when, when you do things like that, do people like Flav have a problem with that? Like, uh, no. Changing the color of a hat is nothing, right? But I mean, there were people that sometimes were unhappy with pictures that went in the mag. And, and there were times that I was unhappy with pictures that went in the mag mm -hmm. just because I might shoot. So I used to literally deliver everything to the magazine and let them choose, mm -hmm. which wasn't always the best thing because our, our, our opinions of what was best would differ. And likewise, the artist's opinion sometimes would differ too, especially like if someone was mid blink or there were, there were some unflattering pictures uh, appeared in Hip Hop Connection. And it, this was a, a little bit frustrating for me. And, um, um, and, and the thing is, I was quite visible when I was out. And so everyone knew me and anyone had a problem with anything in a the magazine, they'd come to me because they didn't know who the writers were. Mm. So I used to get all of it. Like people would come up to me angry about this review or that thing or whatever. And um, when they explained it to me, sometimes I agreed with them. Mm. And uh, I'd say, look, I agree, right? What can I tell you? I'm sorry. I take pictures. <laughs> You're in the front line. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, but I would feed it all back. I would call Andy. I'd say, look, I saw so-and-so. They told me this. I think they've got a point. And, um, but yeah, there's only so much I could do. And like, there were, if things upset me, I, it was like, well, I got a choice. I don't have to be here. Mm -hmm. But that was, my, that was my access. That was everything, right? If I wasn't working for Hip Hop Connection... I wouldn't be able to be all the places I was at. I wouldn't mm. be able to do what I love. So um, I, I, I weighed that up in that way. And so just because something was in the magazine didn't mean I agreed with it 100%. You remember when you used to have those little um, messages from the fans in the back? The letters page? Yeah, the letters yeah, page. Yeah, I remember that. Like I met people from there that were big fans of mine that used to be like, yeah, play wow. this, play that. And I met them and they ended up running distribution companies in Germany and wow. mail orders and stuff. And I was selling a lot of records through them. They were doing my merchandise. So I wonder how many people that connected. Helped. Well, that was the name of the magazine, wasn't it? Yeah, Hip Hop Connection. But there, there were people that would tell me that pictures that I took of them, even if they were in the front section, helped them get distribution deals That's or help them get like and for me i was just reporting what was happening i was painting a picture of what was going on in the clubs and the and the gigs mm. and 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 i was i was give i was trying to give exposure to these people but it did have real effects and it did help people so i, I it's really nice when i hear them kind of stories too I mean, there's stories there that, like I said, there's so many people that may see you with a camera at a club, but they don't understand the depth of what you do and your involvement that's helped the scene grow, because it has. It's been amazing being part of this whole thing. And it, actually, after lockdown, I went to a gig um, and it was a tribute to Ty, rest in peace. Um, and just being in that environment, it was at the Jazz Cafe with all the people, 
it made me realize that, that that's what I loved about the scene as much as the music. I loved the music, but it was the people and just being in that environment with the people like um, and, and just the live environment and just that 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 experience with lots of people with other people it's, it's, it's about yeah we were picking up a lot of knowledge and information and experiences from America yeah do you think America was doing the same from us without a doubt so we were connected with New York and what was going on and they would hear stuff here about stuff that was happening there before they'd heard it was mad the yeah, connection it was crazy. and like uh, we talked about Westwood earlier and he was doing his Funkmaster Flex um, connection. That, actually, that's, that's, that's interesting. Do you think Westwood was responsible for taking the UK stuff to some of those people? Well, and... Westwood used to have uh, people guest on his show. Yeah. Like, I remember there was the girl, uh, there was the black spot, there was the different people on his show would do a New York report and they mm -hmm. would, uh, like that's where I heard the story about J. Roo's one day. Because right, right. someone on Westwood telling the story, Puff is mad because J. Roo put his name on the record and da, yeah. da, 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 da. And I remember asking J. Roo, do you think that releasing that record had a, an effect on your career? And he said, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, because obviously Puff and Flex and Hot 97, Hot 97 was a key in New York and Puff was tight with Flex and mm. all of that. So I don't know. I don't, who knows? Is there anything that you wish to promote my instagram has got a couple of pictures on it it's paul hip-hop twitter's the same uh hiphop.com is up and running and uh um yeah there's plenty plenty of do you want to quickly online explain store. what's going on with the uh, hiphop.com well uh, it's a, it's an online store you can get some nice records on hiphop.com have a look i've been waiting for a long time to talk to this guy because he's a personal friend of mine as are most of the people in the uk hip-hop scene and uh, I just feel like guys like this have got so much interesting stories to tell that we don't know about. I do because I speak to them, but I just feel like their stories need to be heard by more people. So this is what we're doing with the channel. So I'm honored to have you here, Paul. Thank really you, Blake. you making the journey coming down. It's a and, pleasure to be and here. actually catching this on video and not just on the phones. I know, I know. I have to block no. out half a day when I can't phone you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway. To find out more about Paul H, please follow him on all his connection pages. All the relevant links can be found in the description below. Comment, like, share, and click on that bell to receive the notifications. Until next time, thank you for watching.